But I believe this is the moment that God, the Heavenly Father, looked at where he was going, that he was about to die. And he took all of our sins and placed them on the shoulders of Christ. And for the first time in all eternity, the Father and the Son were separated. Separated by my sin, by your sin. morning from Matthew 26 and I'll be reading verses 36 through 46. Now this is the evening of the Last Supper that has just finished and Jesus has just told his disciples that things are about to get crazy. That uh, the shepherd will be struck and the flock will be scattered. Then Jesus came with them to a place place called Gethsemane, and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it is to be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, O my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Amen. This morning, it's going to be a little bit kind of different. Uh, as we've been going through this series on what happened, uh, and, and I've been re- I, to be honest with you, I have enjoyed this. It's been a, a discipline for me to be so restricted about, about the text and overwhelming about the volume of it and pulling out the truths that I would wanted to, that I saw there, and there's just so many. Uh, so we've had a good time with it. I hope you have. But today, what happened on the day that Christ died? That's what we're going to look at. Now, traditionally, he died uh, <clears throat> on Friday. That would have been uh, <clears throat> before the Sabbath. And we call that traditionally Good Friday. Uh, and that's in a couple of weeks. That's the Friday before Easter. But for today, because we're going to start a celebration for Easter next week with the musical, uh, and then the following week, uh, I'll be preaching on the resurrection, and that'll sort of complete the whole series about what happened um, on uh, the series series around Easter. So this, this, t- this week is going to be what happened the day that Christ died. Now, Easter is coming. I want you to remember that all through this message, that Easter is coming. Jesus is the only one that gets that at the moment. But uh, the Easter is coming. Now, the cross is a symbol of his death and a victory for us over, our, uh, over sin. But this morning, uh, we will not be looking at the resurrection. That's, of course, Easter. Today, we're going to 
look at the cross and the events that led up to it, and we're going to stop right at the foot of the cross. So remember, as we're going through this, Easter is coming. Now, this is, today is not going to be a Bible study. It's not going to be a sermon. Uh, from, from my eyes, from the way I prepared for this, I'm just telling the story that Scripture finds. Uh, as I have done in other, uh, other passages, I mean other weeks, I have taken and accumulated the scripture for, uh, uh, through the different gospels and their different perspectives. As you see it on the, uh, um, on the, through the outline, uh, I have listed the key passage that I'm coming from, and I'm throwing in supporting passages from the different gospels as we go through. Uh, so I'm, but I'm going to ask you, and you know, I often tell you, Get a, take the back of the worship bulletin and take notes. Today, I want you to sit there and listen to the story and think of it as the story of his death. And uh, now I'm not saying there's not even some, every now and then some preaching talking points in there, just saying, okay, it's what I am. But, um, but mostly we're going to be talking, talking about the story, the story itself. But uh, it is going to be a little bit different today. Um, last Sunday, we did walk through the Last Supper. We left him in the upper room, and he washed, he washed their feet, and he was teaching them for three or four uh, different chapters. And, of course, we had the high priestly prayer. And then Pharaoh just read of the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. And that's found in Matthew 26. In fact, Mark and Luke both re recorded. And that's where he goes through that process of preparing his own will, uh, own heart to it. And the things that come out of that mainly is that Jesus asked the Father God, knowing what was before him, if this cup could pass, but I will drink of it according to your will. He asked the Father, can we skip this part? And I, no doubt he knew the answer before he asked it. And even after the asking, he said, your will be done. So the, then uh, uh, after praying that prayer three different times, actually, it says, and finding the disciples all three times afterwards asleep uh, and uh, asking, uh, and he wanted them to, to to be on watch, they said, he said, it's time to come. The betrayer is near. Now we're going to pick up now, right now, uh, the, there's the garden of Gethsemane, and now the arrest, the Friday night rest and uh, rest. This is going, uh, primarily coming from Luke 22. And while he was still speaking there in the garden of Gethsemane, that's where he was. He was talking to the disciples. About 500 soldiers ca came up. The one Judas, Judas was called Judas. He was one of the 12 and he approached Jesus with a kiss. And Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the son of man with a kiss? And those around him <clears throat> saw what was going on. And they said, Lord, shall we strike him with a sword? You may remember, he, one of the things he prof, uh, was talking about, things will get bad. And they said, sell what you got and, get, and uh, prepare with the swords. And they brought up, out of the 12 disciples, they had two swords. And no doubt, we, we, we do think this was Peter that pulled this up, pulled this out. And he cut the slave of the high priest. This was been a guard slave. Cut the, uh, cut the ear, the right ear off. And Jesus says, stop! No more! And he touched the ear of the slave and healed it. Jesus said to the chief priest, you, you're coming to me with swords and clubs? I walk in the pure open daylight. You could not have come up to me then? Well, the truth is he, they could not. They, they knew they had to find him alone. That's why the betrayal of Judas is so important. They knew where he was during the day. They could go find him teaching. But if he, they were to go and arrest him around the people, they knew that the people thought he was a prophet and they would have, would have rebelled against that. So they found him where he was alone only with his disciples. <clears throat> and uh, Jesus says, you come at this hour in the middle of the night. 
with the power of darkness yours. Then we have Peter's denial. You know, he, uh, he was prophesied by Jesus, and it wasn't really a prophecy. Jesus just told him, you're going to do this. And uh, after they read, uh, arrested him, they uh, uh, walked him away. They bound him with road and brought him to the house where the high priest was. And again, this is in the middle of the night. And uh, it, the high priest, no get, uh, doubt, hiding uh, in the lack of justice. But Peter was following them. I'm sure because Peter is the one that is mentioned here. The other disciples dispersed and probably were much further away. They're running for their lives. But Peter followed him. And they had kindled a fire in the, in the middle of the courtyard around where this high priest lived. Uh, and uh, they sat down and Peter was amongst them. And, and a servant girl, a servant girl. A, not a servant, even a servant woman, a servant girl. This was the lowest class citizen in the Jewish nation. A service girl uh, uh, said, said to him, seeing by the fire, look, look, this is the man that has been with him too. And Peter, Peter denied it saying, woman, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, okay, loose paraphrase there. I do not know him. A little later, uh, another saw him and said, you're the one with them too. And Peter said, man, I am not. After about an hour passed, another man insisted, certainly this man is one of them, for he is a Galilean too. And Peter said, out of Matthew, he said, he began to curse and swear. Man, I do not know who you are talking about. And immediately the crow, the rooster crowed three times. Peter remembered that before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. So after the arrest and they were there, they, Jesus was beaten all night. And we pull this from Luke 22. They were holding him in custody and they were mocking him and they were beating him. Peter was still off in the distance as far as he could be. And they blindfolded him and they asking him, said, prophesy us the one who hit you. Now, they, they, they knew that these soldiers, they knew that uh, he claimed to be a prophet or the people claimed him to be a prophet. So imagine they blindfolded him, hit him and said, well, who hit you? Come on, if you're a prophet, tell us. I've always wondered what would happen if he went... Yes, I know who you are and called a soldier by name. What would have happened? Can you just imagine that moment? The, the, that soldier jumping back in total fear, all of them looking at each other, taking the blindfold off and stepping away. That's what they'd had to do. But Jesus remained silent. And they were saying other things against him, blaspheming. At, by the way, blaspheming was what Jesus was charged with. That's why he was there. And they were the one that were blaspheming him. So after being, being beat, beaten all night, he went before the Sanhedrin. And this was the council of elders, the people that assembled, both the chief priests and the scribes. They, they led him away there. <coughs> And essentially, this was a religious trial. If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said, if I tell you, you will not believe me. And if I question you, you will not answer. Now, he knew that because he had asked those Pharisees and scribes, some of those same men, that he has asked them many questions and they would left dumbfounded. They would, could not answer him. Verse 69, he continues and says, but from now on, the son of man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. Now, he, they knew that he had referred to himself as the son of man before. And they all said, are, are you the son of God then? Jesus said, yes, I am. And you just got to know how that came across those Jews. They said, what further need do we have for testimony? 
They didn't, they were probably sort of glad because they didn't have any other testimony to come up. But we don't need anything else, for we have heard it ourselves with our own mouths, own mouth, with the, out of his own mouth, with our own ears. They were outraged. They charged him with blasphemy. And he spoke to condemn them. Excuse me. He spoke to condemn himself in their eyes. Jesus knew what he just did. He deliberately said that. So the Sanhedrin wanted him to be dead. They, didn't, they, they, could not, they could punish him, they could put him in jail, but they could not kill him according to the Roman law. So they, they brought him before Pilate because they wanted him dead. So in Luke 23, the governor there, the, the whole body of them got up and brought him before uh, Pilate. This is after the night of be beatings and after the mock trial they gave him. And they, they were concerned because stoning was not enough and they needed a public disgrace of the Roman cross. And they began to accuse him, saying, we have found this man misleading our nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar. Now that was the kicker. Misleading their nation, the Romans could give a rip of what kind of preacher he was. They could give a rip if he was a prophet. But not paying taxes? Mm. Governments don't like that. And if you don't think so, just try that out for a size. Even I, of course, you're not going to end up on a cross because of it. But that's what the accusation they were doing. So that, what that does is that puts him up as a ruler of the Jews, not paying taxes. And they even said that he himself says he's Christ the king, and that's against Rome. So Pilate asked him, are you the king of Jews? It is as you say. Now that came across with no threat whatsoever. Now keep in mind, this is a man that's been beaten all night. He, uh, he no doubt had, looks like he's got a rough hangover. And he did not appear to be a king of any fashion. Pilate said to the chief priest, says, I, I find no guilt in this man. Now, Pilate was a heathen. He was no doubt lost, and he probably was a cruel man, but he wasn't no fool. You don't become the statue in Roman government by being fool. He had the discernment. He could look at this guy and say, this guy is not a threat to me. I get it. So he goes, goes back to him and said, I find no guilt on him, but they kept on insisting. The King James even adds, add, came more, became more insisting the more fierce Amplify says urgent and emphatically they were using emotions because of lack of evidence. And they were saying he stirs up the people teaching all over Judah, starting with Galilee, even as far as places. Then G Pilate had an idea as he went before Herod. Herod was the ruler that beheaded John the Baptist. And when Pilate heard that he, the, he was a Galilean, he went, oh, wait a minute. He's in Herod's jurisdiction. So he sent him to Herod, who he himself was in Jerusalem at that time. Now, Herod was excited. He was glad to see him because he had heard about Jesus and, and, and wanted to meet him for a long time. And uh, he, wanted, he was hearing about all he was doing. And he was hoping to find some kind of sign for forward. If, uh, if you can remember, if you're old enough to remember, come around and walk across my swimming pool. He questioned him at length, but he answered nothing. The chief priests and the scribes were standing there accusing him vehemently and fiercely. Herod and his soldiers were treating him with contempt, mocking him, dressing him in a gorgeous robe, a robe that was to mock his, um, if you would, mock him as a king. And then sent him back to Pilate. See, if Jesus had impressed Herod, it made a difference. Herod could have stopped the crowd if he wanted. He had that power. Jesus did not impress him one way or the other. Herod must have proved of the way Pilate was handling the Jewish leadership, so he sent him back to him. After that, Herod and Pilate became very good friends. Um, in fact, that very day, they had been enemies with each other. A better way might be to put it, they were rivals of each other. 
They had different territories, but sort of the same responsibility, but they were sort of in rival of each other. Then we're going to look at Jesus again before Pilate, Luke 23. Pilate summoned the chief priests and the rulers. He said to them as they brought him to him, uh, that, that this man incites re rebellion. But I has, uh, excuse me, th they brought him back and said, you incite, he incites rebellion. But I've examined him. I find no guilt in this man. That is Pilate saying again, I don't find him uh, guilty on the regards of the charges you have brought him up to. Nor has Herod, he says. He sent him back to us. And I'm sure he grimaced a little there. I find no guilt in him. Nothing deserving death. Therefore, Pilate says, I will punish him and I will release him. Matthew adds that, uh, that his wife uh, came, came to him and said, have nothing to do with this man. I have been tormented and suffered greatly in my dreams about him. Now, most of us have sense enough to listen to our wives. Gentlemen, amen? And especially if your wife comes to you with a, a distressful request, we want to pay attention to this, their wisdom. And again, Pilate shows he is no fool. So he continues um, to, 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 to oblige them and to release them. It's the feast, uh, it's a feast that, that, where they can release one uh, prisoner. And that's what he said, I'll come. I will, I will release you, Barabbas. And he was a Jewish um, a malefactor, I think the scripture calls him. And he was a murderer. He had killed. And, but he was a Jew that was held captive in the, in the Roman government. And he thought, Pilate thought that would appease them. But no, no, they didn't. They, Pilate wanted to release Jesus instead. And Pilate was powerless to persuade the Jews. Pilate wanted to release Jesus. And they kept crying out, crucify him, crucify him. And he said to them for the third time, why? What evil has this man done? I have found him not guilty. Not guilty of anything demands death. I will punish him, and I will release him. But they insisted with loud voices, asking him to be crucified, and their voices prevailed. And Pilate pronounced the sentence, and their demand was met. Matthew records that Pilate saw that he could accomplish nothing, rather that a riot was about to start. He took water and washed it, and washed his hands in front of the crowd, publicly washed his hands. And as he washed his hands, he said, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And the people said, his blood will be on us. And do not let this escape you. Your, his blood will be on us and our children. And in less than 40 years, the temple was destroyed. And the Jewish nation has not had temple worship since. And he released the man, Barabbas. They were asking, excuse me, they released Jesus, the man they were asking for. They threw him in prison as, and delivered them Jesus. I'm sorry, they delivered Jesus to him. John says, Pilate took Jesus and scourged him with a whip. Now, it scourged him. I started to just qualify this as a PG-13 uh, PG uh, sermon. But you have to understand what a scourging is. Uh, we, we know what a, uh, when you, they get whipped and often they were, um, would take strips of wood and pound the backside of uh, the, the men over and over and over again. It was very, very painful, but it was basically benign and not life-threatening. A scourge was different, and that, that kind of flogging was common back then. 
But a scourging opposed to the flogging is totally different. Had a totally different tool. The tool they had was mounted on a stick about this far and had leather strips on it. And on the leather strips, at the end of the leather strips, were pieces of metal and glass. And they were at different lengths. The man that used the scourge was an expert at it. He knew exactly how to, to, to produce the most pain without taking his life. So much so that it was a law that they could only do it 39 times because 40 would kill a man. That's how precise they were. And in this scourging, they would tie him, tie him down to a, to a post and have his bare back showing. And they would take the scourge and take it, and he would take it like a whip and hit the backside, and it would wrap all the way around to his rib cage. And he had, had the talent that he could take and twist it to where it would just literally come across his back and just serrate all the skin that's on the back of it. And then after it would do that, and it would become moist from his fluids, that he, he would put it on the ground, drag it like this and then take it and whip it again in a different spot. And after 30, 40 lashes like this, his back is nothing but raw meat. Almost every inch of his skin has been whipped off. And the soldiers also took a crown of thorns uh, and uh, the crown of thorns is another one of those things that we look at and we, we often see them. I've seen churches that have a, a, a crown made out of thorns hanging on the cross to remind us what it is. Uh, I used to know what they called it. It's an actual bush over there that put, produces crown, the, uh, <clears throat> a vine that has thorns on it that are almost two inches long. And uh, when they cut it fresh, they're just like uh, most uh, limbs it would be. The thorns themselves are very, they're limber. They're not brittle, but they are razor sharp. And so they took this vine or this bush and took the limb and wove it into a crown. And then when they placed it on his head, the thorns himself would go down through the skin to the skull and stay between the skin and the skull and literally was nailed, if you would, tacked, certainly stuck on his head that way. So it's not just a symbol. It's not just he got stuck by a rose bush, but his head, his skull has been penetrated by the multiple thorns on this crown. <laughs> and then they put a purple robe on his back. They had to do that to stop the bleeding. His, the way his back was cut up they put the robe, rub on there, the robe on there to literally mat the blood so it would not, he would not bleed to death before he got to the cross. And then they came to him saying, Hell, king of the Jews, and gave him slaps on the face. Well, slaps on the face are not nowhere near concerned about his uh, well-being uh, or, or the pain compared to what he's already been through here. But that purple robe saying... Oh, you're the king of the Jews? Well, hey, let's just pretend on that. So there he is, got the robe, he's got the crown, and they have the nerve to do the most insulting thing a man can do to another man, and that is just to slap him on the face. Rather you punch me in the nose than slap me. Then we start the crucifixion. Luke 23, verse 26. They led him away. Many of historians say they carried him away because he could hardly stand. And they seized the man, Simon of Cyrene, uh, uh, coming from an, another country, and they placed the cross on his back because Jesus couldn't hardly walk, much less carry the cross. But he carried the cross behind Jesus, following large crowds of people and women that were mourning and lamenting. And he stopped and looked at these women there's much speculation about who they were. But he simply says, Daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me. But weep for yourself and for your children. Why? Because 
it was their family that were part of the ones that said, let the blood be on us and our children. For behold, the days will be said that blessed are the barren and the wombs that will never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Jesus continues, says, there will, they will begin to say to these mountains, fall on us and the hills, cover us. For they will do these things when the tree is green. What will they do when it's dry? If they will treat the Son of God when you have blessings among you, they're going to treat them like this. What will happen when things get bad? Two other criminals were with him. They led them away too. And they came to a place that's called the skull in New American Standard. John 19, 17 says they took Jesus therefore and went out bearing a cross to a place called the skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. Now we know that, that term Golgotha. We see it uh, in most of our Easter programs. Um, King James uses the term Calvary there, which we get the term that we so sing about blessedly. The reason we call it Calvary is because the Latin word for skull or Golgotha, the Latin word is Calvaria. Maybe I pronounced that right. But it, you look at it and you can see that's where the English word Calvary came from. And they crucified Jesus and the criminals. One on the right, one on the left. The cross they put him on, historians are very clear about this. The uh, crucifixion of Christ is one of the most uh, verifiable events in all of history of antiquity. The Roman cross uh, is uh, well, well defended in history. So we know that this cross was probably about 12 feet tall, and uh, they took spikes. And a lot of times you see the spikes in the hand right here. They did not put a spike right here. And, you know, the, sometimes you get the railroad spike size. They used a smaller, longer nail that was skinnier. Probably wasn't much bigger than a finger. But it was sharp. And they would take it and put it right between the bones and the wrists. The uh, weight of a human being couldn't be held up by the, just the tissue in here. But here it could be held up. So they put the, they nailed him right there to the cross on both arms and then they crossed his legs and when they crossed his leg they nailed his leg his feet to the cross they also put his heels on a block of wood so he could actually stand on that and then they nailed his feet to that block of wood so that's that's how they put him on the cross now they did all that while he was laying on the cross on the ground and then, of course, it takes a couple of men. They, they pick him up and they put him up. And there is, they, they took the cross and they put it in a hole that was the size, the size of the cross. In fact, if you go over to do a tour over in uh, Israel, there's a place, the, the, I, I don't, the Church of something. But they say that this is the actual hole where the cross uh, is. Of course, nobody's not sure about that. But this is, this is the Roman tradition. And as they would slide that, now, it's a 10-foot it's a cross. It's got, that hole's got to be deep enough to support that cross. So that hole is probably two to three feet. So imagine Jesus being nailed to this cross with his back already completely lacerated. And they pick him up, get up there, and then all of a sudden that cross goes, boom, falls three feet and stops just like that. And then his tissues and his hands and his feet take the full blunt of his entire weight. It was a cruel, cruel execution for the Romans. Some of them stayed on the cross for six days. Usually they died simply of not having enough water. Now we begin what is known as the seven sayings of Christ on the cross. Again, in Luke, Jesus said, the first saying, 
And the fact that this is the first one just gripped me this time. He's been through all of this. He sees those Roman soldiers mocking him. The Jews are mocking him. He, there's a few women there that are mourning him. And the first words out of his mouth on the cross is, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. The soldiers cast lots, dividing up the garments, for amongst them, amongst them was a, They took his garments and they divided them amongst lot, with a lot. And the people stood looking on him, naked on that cross. The rulers were sneering at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If this is the Christ of God, if he's the chosen one, let him save himself. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him, offering him sour wine, which bad wine. And that would put just enough moisture in his mouth. And saying, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. And there's an inscription on, above the cross that said the king of the Jews. And the priest protested on that. They went, they went back to the uh, pilot and said, said, put on there, he says he's the king of the Jews. And Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. The soldiers, when they crucified him, they took the outer garments and made four parts of them. And it was part of the booty of being, a, uh, being one of the uh, soldiers on this squad that uh, was the execution squad, if you would. Uh, so they parted to the soldiers. But there's one tunic. The tunic is the, the, the gown or the, the large uh, the, uh, clothing that's closest to the skin. And this, this one was seamless and woven in one piece. Now, this was like a, a tunic with something that hangs on you, and it was woven, not sewn together, woven into one piece. No doubt uh, some of the ladies that loved Jesus had made it for him, and he had it on. But they didn't want to rip that up, so they decided they would uh, fulfill the scriptures without deciding to fill the scriptures. They decided to cast lots, and it fulfilled the, the scriptures. They divided my outer garments among them, and for my clothing they cast Lots. So you got three guys up there, Jesus in the middle. Then one of the guys, one of the criminals says, this hanging there, hurling abuse at him, joining in with the crowd, and said, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and save us too. But the other answered and rebuked him. Do you not even fear God since you are under the same sentence and condemnation? We indeed are suffering justly. He knows they deserve to be there. For we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man, this man has done nothing wrong. Then he looked over to Jesus. And he said, Jesus... Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Some say that this uh, man that was being executed just in the same manner Jesus was, that he was already a believer and a follower of Christ. The more traditional view is that um, he saw who he was on the cross and was converted on the cross. Either way, he knew who Jesus was and he knew what to say to him. Remember me. Truly I say to you, Jesus says for the second saying, you will be with me in paradise. And then the setup for the third saying is uh, from John. And he says to his mother, and, it, cause, and John, um, uh, the beloved apostle, was with him. Uh, and he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, John, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her as his own in his household. 
His family business was done. He had fulfilled the will to take care of his family, if you would. And about the sixth hour, darkness fell on the whole land and about until the ninth hour. And Matthew says that uh, Jesus, for the fourth saying, cries out, Eli, Eli, lama shabachthani, which that is to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of those that were standing around him heard him and saying, look, he's calling out for Elijah. Is he going to show up? He was not calling for Elijah. I believe, though there's not chapter and verses in this exactly, but I believe this is the moment that God, the Heavenly Father, looked at where he was going, that he was about to die, and he took all of our sins and placed them on the shoulders of Christ. And for the first time in all eternity, the Father and the Son were separated. Separated by my sin, by your sin. Jesus felt it. And he cried out, Why? Why have you forsaken me? The most beloved verse in all scripture, John 3, 16, says that for God so loved the world that he gave his son. This is what that verse means. God did not give his son to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to feed 5,000 people, or even to rebuke religious leaders. He did not give his son even to preach. He gave his son to die for our sins. God loved us so much that he did not answer his son's question, why? He turned his back. Nothing else matters. Nothing else matters compared to bearing our sins. The mocking was meaningless. The beating was petty. The the scourging was insignificant. The crown of thorns was pointless. The driven nails was nothing. The spear in his size was senseless unless he bore our sins. Back to Luke. Because the sun was obscure, a veil a veil from the temple was torn, separating the holy of holies, symbolizing no other sacrifices would ever be needed. John says in, that Jesus, knowing all things have been accomplished to fulfill the scripture. And I, I looked up just, as, just this morning to say, okay, what scripture is he talking about? He's, there's no one scripture here. This is a reference. All the scriptures about Jesus and his death have been fulfilled. He knew that. And he said, I'm thirsty. They lifted up some more sour wine to him. Put a sponge to it with a hyssop branch. Jesus received it. He said, it is finished. All that Jesus came to do was done. And he cried out with a loud voice, a voice of strength. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. After he said that, he breathed his last breath. The veil torn top from bottom. The earth shook. The rocks were split. 
tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered into the holy city appearing to many. This is one of those things that we sort of, get, uh, sort of miss on Easter. Is that many were risen from the dead the day he died. Can you imagine the loved ones saying, what are you doing here? And they go, I don't know what's happened. Well, Jesus died. The one that, the one that healed everybody and raised Lazarus, that's the one that I, his death raised me. What a testimony. And now, there was a centurion that saw all this that was happening. And he began praising God. Now, the centurion, no doubt, was the commander of the squad that just crucified him. He began praising God and he said, certainly this man is innocent. Now those who were with him keeping guard over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening all around, they became very frightened. And even they said, truly, this was the Son of God. And the crowds, the crowds came together for, for this spectacle. They came together for this spectacle. When they observed what had all happened, they returned beating their breasts. They had realized that this man was not the guilty one. Many were saying that he was the Son of God. John asked that nobody's should be on the Sabbath, and the Sabbath was started at sundown on Friday night. The Jews asked them to break the legs so he would die. And on the Roman cross, when they, uh, because they would, could, some could last up to six days on the cross, they had to uh, make sure they was dead. So they asked him to break the legs, and they went and broke the legs of the two on each side of him. And you say, well, what's that got to do with it? Well, I mentioned that the wooden piece that the, the heels were uh, nailed to and the arms were stretched out like this. Well, when he was hanging down like this, under this stress, his body could not breathe. Nobody could breathe under that, under that stress. And so to take a breath as a man was dying on the cross, they would pick themselves up, take a breath, and then relax again. Yeah. And this was the way they breathed for hours or days. Well, because they wanted to make sure he was dead and they didn't want to have to deal with the body uh, on Sunday, which would have what it would have taken, they asked him, please, break their legs. So when they had done that, they, and the others, uh, he, they saw that he was dead and did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side and immediately blood and water came out. Now, these were professional executors. They knew exactly what they were doing. They took that spear, and they took that spear, and they went right up here under the rib cage and went all the way to the heart. And they knew that when they saw the water, if you would, non-blood fluids come out, that death had occurred, and he was already starting decomposing. They knew he was dead. So they did not break his legs. So what happened here? Jesus died. The Prince of Peace died. The Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the Messiah, Christ the Anointed One died. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died for you, for your sins, and for mine. A Savior died. For the next two weeks, next two Sundays, we will celebrate Easter and His resurrection. But today, we, re we remember that he gave himself to be crucified.
He gave himself for your sins, for my sins. Next Sunday, we celebrate Easter. On Easter, we celebrate his resurrection. Till then, we remember he died. You are dismissed. <laughs>